to double back on ourselves, or we are not going to spend too much time just sort of with my with my CV here. I've uh, first met my first Mac when I was in the, uh, middle school. Much of my professional work has been uh, about in integrating Apple products into Active Directory, uh, and you know, bringing higher levels of service, Ma and you know, working with Mac OS X Server, Casper Suite, and I've headed up two major dual booting initiatives at both Goucher College and uh, in at Towson University. And a little bit about Towson University is Towson University. You can read the whole sort of uh, sort of discussion, but it's a what we call medium-sized university in northern Baltimore County. And um, as they say, they try to uh, ooh, they try to kind of create sort of the small college environment in a larger university. And the Albert S. Cook Library, where I work, is the main library on campus. Uh, which is sort of a central academic hub, and as our dean always tends to remind us, no one ever graduated from a library, but no one ever graduated without one. So libraries, of course, are important. Uh, you can learn more at the URLs. I am, I'm pleased that they let me join you today. Uh, so as in, in terms of an agenda, we're gonna walk through the many aspects of dual booting. We'll have some history and background. We'll talk the good, the bad, and the ugly. We'll get some other Mac admins impressions gathered from a survey that I've sort of put in the field, and we'll try to leave ample time for questions. Uh, my, my iPhone is will tell me to shut up at uh, 60 minutes from, a little less than 60 minutes from now. So, and then you guys will talk until, uh, you know, the band plays me off. So, uh, so what's this session? What's in this session? It's a 365 degree look at dual booting. Uh, Mac OS, I'm trying to use the new nomenclature. I'm still getting used to it. Uh, wi and Windows. Uh, we're not gonna talk about Linux or other operating systems just because that's kind of out of the scope of, we'd be here for longer. And it just, it, it's not, I think, what a lot of people's use cases. And this is not gonna be particularly technical. We're gonna talk some processes and, pro and some products will be discussed, but this is more about sort of why you wanna take on this project, if you do, or why you might wanna avoid it. But this session isn't. It's not a full-blown look at end-to-end, end-to-end at return on investment or uh, total cost of ownership. We'll talk about that a little bit. We can talk about that in our discussion, but uh, we're not gonna go there too. We're, that's gonna be touched on along with a lot of things we touch on. This is not a workshop or technical session, though tech will be discussed. If you're looking for a boot camp on boot camp, this isn't it. We're, let's, so is it worth it? Let's define worth. Let's jump in and get to an operational definition. I love operational definitions, knowing where we're all standing. So uh, Merriam-Webster defines worth as a simple, uh, simply said, is an amount of something that has to be has a specified value. It lasts for a specified length of time. The amount of something, or the amount that something is worth, or the usefulness or importance. I think given the factors in this session and what we're talking about, I am really, stuck on this one. I think this is what we want to talk about. And of course, just a lovely sort of a quote about tech. Any s sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic, which is from Arthur C. Clarke. And I'd, I'd say dual boot isn't that, but one, one can hope. Dual booting, what is dual booting? By the way, anyone, if I'm going too fast or you can't hear me, speak up, let me know. You know, I, I have no pride. Uh, what is dual booting? On modern computers, it's configure, a, a computer is configured to consistently utilize two operating systems and their associated applications. In this case, we're talking about everybody in the Macintosh computer running Mac OS and Windows. Multi-booting or dual booting isn't new. Early Apple IIs and IBM computers that used floppies had OSs on that floppy. So in theory, you could boot to diff 20 different op operating systems or versions of the operating system a day and not really know it because it was kind of under the hood. But it's nothing new, and of course, anyone who's worked with Linux knows about, you know, all you can boot to have different kernels and all kinds of different stuff. So it's, that's, this is not, like, this is not news. Uh, what is Apple's vision for boot camp is very simple. It's this, it's the home, it's the home use scenario. You know, get the most out of your Mac by being able to run Windows on it too. Of course, it's an exceptionally old Apple ad, if anyone remembers it. Uh, so how is boot camp actually involved, boot camp? All boot camp really is, is, and this 
that's probably not super news to you guys. It's a wizard that helps you install Windows on your Macintosh computers. A set of, and a set of Windows drivers. Bootcamp helps the system boot, dual boot, but is not 100% required for dual booting. This is a common mistake that I find is made by users and non-technical management. You can dual boot a Mac without getting the boot camp installer really involved. But Apple's made the decision, you know, largely uh, to, to help folks to include dual boot camp, but dual booting and boot camp are not synonymous. Or they're, they're interrelated, but they're not necessarily linked in the same way some folks think. So dual booting is not a panacea. There are advantages and disadvantages. Everything is not awesome. But I think folks who have tried it know. How many folks have tried it? How many folks have tried it on some kind of massive scale? Okay. How many folks have scars because of that? <laughs> uh, yeah, I gotcha. I used to have sanity. No, that never really happened. I mean, uh, so what is this really about? Let's go back to the 90s and find out. Good idea. Climbing a mountain. Bad idea. Climbing a mountain blind. So that's what we got to consider when we're thinking about dual booting. Is it a good idea or a bad idea? Um, so why might you want to do this? Sometimes it is a good idea. Sometimes it's a necessity. It addresses inclusivity and exclusivity, which I'll talk about a little bit more because that's uh, a, a way to think about that I think could be helpful to you. Um, Apple hardware tends to be nice. That's something good. Uh, hardware is built well, lasts a long time, tends to have a better uh, Total cost of ownership, you know, your Apple rep, if, you, if you've got one, I know mine did, you know, shared some nice white papers about sort of total cost of, cost of ownership. You can dive into that stuff. The iMac, I know in an Ed situation, is a very appealing form factor, though many PC manufacturers are catching up. I mean, Dell makes some pretty nice all-in-ones now. So, you know, Apple can't ha couldn't have had that for, couldn't have been exclusive on that forever. Uh, so let's talk about inclusivity and exclusivity. If you want to address inclusivity, that is the idea that you might want to make for using dual boot, make users able to have the features of the two most popular Western world operating systems on one computer and offer your users a choice over their computing environment. That's sort of inclusivity. You're trying to include everybody or get everyone. Exclusivity is sort of the flip side of that, which is gives users who primarily use one operating system access to features and applications that are on the other. So for example, an exclu trying to hit an exclusive would be if you really need Mac OS, but you need projects. So then you might, then you'll need Windows. Or if you really use Windows OS, but Windows, I guess it's 10 now, you know, but you really, but you have a need for Final Cut Pro. So, you know, like that's, that's sort of the, these are two sort of sides of this coin. Uh, why it's not a good idea. <laughs> Sometimes it's just a bad idea. Half-baked. Uh, but, uh, example, you know, your C CIO thinks it's cool, or someone's like, I wanna have a Mac on my desk, but I really want to run Windows the whole time. Uh, and sometimes it's there are other technologies could handle this better, like software as a service or virtualized applications might function better. This can be more expensive than you might first think, and it can be very labor intensive, which like as our, our friend without, who, who used to have hair talks about, uh, knows, I'm sure. Uh, a little aside, are you still fighting platform wars? Are these dual boot systems some kind of a bargain? Like they, are they some sort of grand bargain? Is your, is your system a new battle in platform wars or the last one? Do you not know yet? I mean, do, do fo have folks ever had it sort of had, who have done this ever had this feeling like this is something on, along these lines? Yeah, I mean, I felt like that way. I, I had a, a story from the from the front lines was. We were building the library uh, at my previous institution, and they're like, we want dual boot max. We want dual boot max, and so we worked up uh, the first dual boot max situation we had, 
And then we, I worked on it for 10 months, and then that was rejected. Or it was like, oh, we're going to buy half Dells anyway. And I, uh, I had a postal moment. I didn't go there, but, you know, it's still out there, regrettably. But these are awesome gentlemen, so that's cool, too. Uh, so change is inevitable. Change is constant. We're going to talk about the, in, we're going to talk about PowerPC goes to Intel. Intel transition, which a lot of you know, the decision was made uh, to move away from the PowerPC architecture, and a lot of this had to do with lack of innovation in the PowerPC that, be, that uh, was going on at Motorola. Uh, and it came to head when our, 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 our late friend, Steve Jobs, lost his temper with Motorola and decided to go with Intel. Now, in, now things like Project Star Trek and stuff like that, which you may have heard of, uh, and just the notion that this is all from, that Mac OS X is from Next Step, going to the Intel platform wasn't as, it had been toyed with previously, so it's not like this was a completely crazy idea. The transition was announced on June 5th, 2005. The process was completed in early 2006. It was announced, I think, at Worldwide Developer. Or no. I'd have to look. What, what was it? I think it was a Macworld. Okay, my, that was when Macworld, they still, Apple still sort of did Macworld. Yeah, you're right. There's a nice discussion of it on pages 446 through 448 of Steve Jobs, the, wonder, the wonderful or terrible book, depending upon your point of view on it. Uh, after the transition, uh, which actually ends in a really neat passage by, 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 Steve, uh, by Bill Gates, who was very impressed by this whole phenomenon, because he's like, I didn't, I'm paraphrasing him from the book, but it says, I didn't really care, I, the idea that you could make candy colored Macs or anything like that didn't impress me. The fact that you could change architecture in a year and largely not skip a beat did impress me. So that's, that's at the end of that section, that's kind of a neat uh, turn of phrase. A uh, little insight into that relationship. After 206, all Apple computers were Intel and technically able to run Windows. And also because, you know, more people were using sort of, including Apple using stock components, and there was less invented here products that made running Windows also very possible. So what are your parts of, parts of a dual boot enterprise? You have mass deployment, which I, and there, I know there are lots of sessions on the sketch about that, which you know, you can use something like Deploy Studio, Casper, WinCone, other solutions. That's it on the Mac, and you can also, for things like Ghost and other things, do that. There are lots of our vendors here who want to talk to you about how they can do that. Uh, for various levels of dollars. Uh, and then, of course, you need OS support and so up to OS and software support. Like, so you had Mac OS X, have and had, that's kind of debatable. Uh, Windows Server, ubiquitous, and all the various things that come along with it, like SCCM uh, and such. Casper Suite is a popular one. You've got Monkey, Puppet, and many more. If I've missed your, fa your favorite management suite, Please pardon me. Uh, and we, you know, if, you, if you've got a pretty good one, we can talk about it when we sort of get to the chatting bit. Uh, you've got hardware support, and you've got to provide a method to choose the OS. I mean, there's the old, ever popular alt key, but that's kind of, that, that's, that's pretty manual. You have refined, you have boot runner, which is uh, Tim Privet's product, uh, Two Canoes, was over here. Anyway, uh, I've got custom solutions. I talked to somebody, and if they're in the audience, to, to raise your hand. Ah, it was you, nice to, t nice to see you again. Over at Stanford, who actually had built sort of uh, boot into the alternate operating system buttons on each operating system. That's really cool. You'll have to show me a screenshot of that someday. <laughs> ah, but, oh, my heart is broken. Okay, cool. But you can do a lot of different stuff. And, I, and then this gets to something important is, it's often it boils down to time or expertise, so, or, or money or expertise. Do you have the money to buy something like uh, Boot Runner, or do you have the expertise to build something like, uh, like the Stanford solution? So dual boot, let's get to the card of this matter. Dual booting's dirty secrets. You're still running two OS's, sorry guys. Gals, everybody. You might need twice as many minions. I, I mean staff, I'm a minion, I, I admit to it. Uh, to work on this, you'll need 
more support technology to monitor and keep up to OSs. So you're gonna need a Mac management product like Mac OS X, Casper, or another solution, and you're gonna need a Windows management product, like SCCM, Ghost, or something else. I mentioned specific products here, there are lots of products. So if I miss one, that's, you know, it's just because we're trying to, brevity and, and what I have personally worked with. Some more dirty secrets, depending on your needs, costs could be very high, monetary costs. To achieve, what you, if you're trying to achieve 100% parity, you might have to literally buy software twice. For example, Creative Cloud, though if you get, I think it's a, I forget, there's a certain, there's a special license you can get that will let you install on multiples, uh, but it's very, like in an enterprise, it's important to understand your vendor contracts, your vendors and your contracts. Some educational institutions, like where I come from, have consortia that they get uh, sort of pricing from. I work, I work in Maryland, we have this thing called Meek, which is the Maryland Educational Consortium, and that, you know, we sort of buy these sort of blanket licenses that give us very liberal, liberal rights on software. But that's, and then there are different, I checked around, and there are other consortia. So, you know, this could be prohibitive in terms of cost, or it could not be, but you have to be aware of that. Uh, if you are exclusively a Mac OS or Windows shop, you'll need to purchase and learn additional tools for management. <coughs> Getting to the end of Dirty Secrets, we got our staffing expertise costs. If your staff is very talented in maintaining either operating system, there will still be an, a learning curve. You need to support these operating systems and your staff will need to get up to speed. In the area of management, there are many uh, free open source software tools, but and like Monkey is a popular one around here, Repaso, other things get mentioned. But, uh, but your staff will need time and expertise to learn them. Again, like this, I was mentioned earlier, the balance between money versus expertise and time. Uh, So it's hard, and I'll quote the, the popular Kennedy quote. So we chose to we choose to go to the moon. We choose to go to the moon and do the other things. I am not going to try a Kennedy voice, thanks. We choose to go to the moon and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard, and the challenge is one that we are willing to accept. So if you're, are you ready? Are you prepared? Are you gonna go with uh, President Kennedy and uh, try the thing that is hard? because this isn't, as I said, not the panacea. Is your enterprise primed to support this kind of process? You will need to support both OSs. Do you really, do you really have this kind of support in place? Are you willing to put it in place? Are you prepared to do what is hard, to work hard? Further on your to be prepared, I would recommend that you get your project management on. I mean, that, honestly, any IT project, it, this is kind of important, but you know, how many folks have, 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 have met a PMBOK, have done the project, have done project management? Uh, ah, yes. Let me see here. This is the book that you will begin to love or hate, depending upon you. Uh, but the objective of project management, which is universal, it's not particularly for IT, is initiating, planning, executing, monitoring, and controlling, and closing. In essence, being smart about how you conduct your project, not just kind of going off, off half-cocked. Um, in my experience with dual, with dual booting, planning is the most critical step. And particularly they talk in there, sort of folded in there if you look into the PMBOK or you look on some other sites that sort of summarize the PMBOK. Requirements gathering and scope setting and expectations. You know, don't, make sure your management knows what is realistic to expect and what is not realistic to expect. <coughs> Does this work in real life? Sometimes, but it really depends upon your corporate culture. Does this, does, being as structured as, as, as the PMBOK would, would have you be, work in real life. You'd hope so, and maybe this would be a time, if you haven't done it, you could try, but it's, and work with a good project plan, but I know in both instances, I sort of wish I had, you do as I say, not do as I do, because, or do as I did, 
because in both cases I did more of the by the seat of my pants, which was unfortunate. But you can still get through. So I'm going to talk about the, the survey uh, and the testimonials. So quite a few very kind members spoke with me uh, uh, and offered ideas via phone, email, and this online survey. Thank you everybody for your help. Who, if you are here or you know if you're out there in that greater world, thank you. Uh, I do want to note because I'm from a university. This is very this is very informal information, and in the way it was gathered is no way complete, not particularly scientific, and not IRB reviewed. I'd actually like to take this into sort of like a academic paper direction, but I need to say that. I think no Mac admins were hurt in the process of gathering this information, but I don't know that. Uh, many have asked that their comments remain anonymous. Names were used only with permission. So folks, we had about 66 participants, just to clarify about, you can sort of do the numbers here, but. Uh, when asked whether or not you have done this, the answer was 79.4 did and 20 hadn't in my respondents. Have you found the, found the process worthwhile? Slightly more people said yes, slightly less said no. So we, here we have a quote from Bruce who said, we have programs that require, in terms of why he would do this, we have programs that require applications that are unique to both platforms. Putting two sets of hardware in place is not feasible. Dual booting is the only reasonable course of action. That's what Bruce thought about it. Dual booting is worth the trouble when there are compelling business cases, when there is a compelling business case that requires running Mac, running Windows and Mac when virtual will not meet the need. In the past 12 months, we've been advocating here internally to stop dual booting. So this is sort of the, the other side of the coin. You, your questions so far have been in the past tense and up to date, it's been worth it. However, going forward, I no longer see the effort required worth the advantages. So it's, is, the, is, the, is the sand shifting? We'll find out. Have you, now let's talk about money, our favorite things. Uh, have you found the process to be financially advantageous? Yes or no? Most people say yes. Some said no. Of course, it was sort of a one, one or the other question, but a lot, a more people did say yes. I find that somewhat surprising given some caveats that uh, we've already talked about. Have you found the process to be financially detrimental? Most people didn't think so, but enough did that I think it's worth knowing. Have you found the process to be functionally advantageous? And 96%, that's pretty awesome. I showed this to Tim Perfett, the guy who uh, runs Two Canoes. He was very impressed with this statistic. He thought this was very significant. It is functionally advantageous. People still feel to be functionally advantageous. Have you found the process to be functionally detrimental? There are though there is a, a largest group that, that didn't find it to be function that found it to be functionally detrimental. This these are sort of contradictory slides because the way the survey worked was did you find it worth it? Did you not find it worth it? It was branching logic and then you got sent down to two separate sets of questions. So it kind of comes out in the wash, I would say. So I found dual booting to be a pain to deploy when trying to deploy two different images to the same Mac. Experience issues with DNS. As we all know, it's all about DNS around here. Uh, as well as issues pushing out timely GPOs. The alternative to dual booting would be to leverage virtual technologies like VMware, Citrix, or Parallels. So this alternative has its own problems when implementing a virtual environment. From a horse's mouth, a lovely Mac admin horse's mouth. Uh, presents difficulty with Active Directory, says Andrew, in keeping accurate inventory and imaging tools. Casper's imaging, which is our primary tool, using Casper imaging, which is our primary tool. This is Andrew, who replaced me when I left Goucher College. 
Uh, what successes have people had with this process? We were able to remove Windows PCs from the lab and have only Apple hardware. R Ross Schaefer at Stevenson University. Here's someone who has a very good point, which is one model computer to rule them all. Easy planning, budgeting, purchasing replacements, supporting 50-50 mix of Windows and Mac OS users. T tremendous hardware reliability with Macs, and even certified techs cannot fix an issue. There's an Apple store within 30 minutes of our campus. I don't know where this, folk, this gentleman or lady is from, but that's, that's good to know. <laughs> Here is in some ways the crux of, of that sort of idea about exclusivity. I was able to run one piece of Windows, lab, Windows only lab software. Sweet, short, sweet, simple, but, but true. I have found that for the money, solid work runs very well on Mac and keep solid works run. Hmm, interesting grammar. These are taken directly, so off the for me. Uh, and can keep my overall costs down. What challenges have people, had the folks who talked to me cited? Large image deployments take some time, especially for large portions, partitions. That's Ross again. Uh, keeping both OSs updated with OS patches and software updates, hard time keeping them in a time sink. I have dealt with that. In different, uh, even with different red edits, it may be different, though they think it might be different Windows 10. That's Steven. One of the biggest problems we had with the initial deployment of operating systems, no real set of instructions to go by, no standards. Trying to get both images into workstation without failing, the imaging process took a very long time. So a lot about deployment. And of course, if you look at our sched, there's a lot about deployment and provisioning in this conference. Other thoughts people shared. We have, we have been 95% dual boot here since 2008. So if you feel like you've, so I feel like I've seen it all. That said, it would take, it will take me a year to convince anyone that we should not do it anymore. Classrooms, so we got an ed user here are a big issue because we use Mac minis with SSDs and rather, and would rather not install two computers in, in there, by there I assume the classroom. The solution here looks like more laptops for faculty, longer term th looking at things like VDI. Andrew, again from the gentleman from Goucher College, he, he got rid of dual boots. He said, I eliminated dual boots entirely, found it in a worthwhile endeavor, and I'm glad to no longer have to worry about them in our environment. Here's someone who I am not going to try to, uh, I'm not going to, I don't want to butcher their name. Anyone want to guess? <laughs> but they join us from Switzerland. Dual boot is good for switching when virtualization can be poor in terms of performance. A 3D high computing. Uh, this is a very nice uh, quote from a gentleman I do know, which is, it would be nice to have, be nice to have adding Windows on a Mac hardware as a bit more of an expected activity rather than feeling like it was a hack or workaround. In a high use environment, there can be a need to make sure you get everything you can out of each machine. I think dual booting machines has a lot of value. And finally, finally, a developer's point of view. This is from Tim Privet from Two Canoes. Dual booting has been a consistent part of our business and people continue to find great value in running Mac and Windows on the same hardware. We just make the process easier. So is dual booting past its prime. Show of hands, what do you think? Is dual booting past its prime? All right, interesting. I'm gonna go with yes and no. No, it isn't past its prime because you, if, if you need direct access to hardware for both OSs, then dual booting is still the way to go. If you're trying to give users a choice from one computer, dual booting may be your way to go. 
But some virtualization solutions might work. I know there's a process in Boot Runner 2 that kind of, they can kind of sort of simulate that phenomenon. Uh, we've tried it out a little bit, we're trying it some more. Reasons why it might be past its prime. If you need general Windows-centric application functionality, virtual applications, del delivery, like VDI, might be better for something, you know, like an app like Word or something somewhat lightweight. Also, if your needs are bet met better by internet or cloud service, like Google Drive or Office 365, any modern OS should work. You really aren't married to an OS at that point. You just need a modern browser and probably HTML5. <coughs> So I should, I want to preface this. Uh, I first talked about dual boots, it's getting on uh, seven, 10 years ago, uh, um, about what we've done at Yasser College, and we played this clip, because Angel, and I'll explain why. You know, it's just occurred to me, we really haven't had a completely successful test of this equipment. I blame myself. So do I. Uh, no sense worrying about it now. Why worry? Each of us is wearing an unlicensed nuclear accelerator on his back. Yep. Yeah. Let's get ready. Switch me on. So I felt that very adeptly that when I first did this presentation, you know, we quoted Ghostbusters where because this was sort of a new procedure and we didn't know what uh, what would come of it. Does it still apply? Yes, because technology is always changing. There are new challenges. So we have Sierra as a challenge. Windows 10, System Integrity Protection in Boot Camp. 5K IMAX in Boot Camp. Achieving your goals with alternatives like virtualization or software as a service. Apple is somewhat hands off about the, and, and has some inconsistent support of the boot camp drivers. Well, Apple keep doing this in the future. People did wonder about that in the survey. Will Apple support the version of Windows that your enterprise uses? They tend to, I, I believe, someone can correct me, that in El Capitan, Windows 10 is kind of what really boot, the boot camp uh, assistant will let you do. And if you're a Windows 7 person, you've got to get a little creative. Oh, okay. Good to know. He just said, I, uh, depends on the model that you've got. Conclusions. Dual booting can be a productive tool. It has its drawbacks. The process can be troublesome, but when well executed, it can offer many benefits. You need a strong use case. You need to be prepared for the effort and cost. There are alternatives that might work better for your use case. Here are some resources. Some we've talked about. I mean, here's you know the, what, the the OS is in question and Boot Camp, Deploy Studio, which I know a lot of folks use, two canoes soft big packages, which are WinCoin Five and Boot Runner Jamf. There are other things out there. This is not an exclusive list. I want to acknowledge a few folks. I don't really need to name them, but they're, you know, my management, the management here, my Apple system engineer, uh, Two Canoes was a great help, Jamf Nation and the Mac Enterprise Listserv. They were great helps to me, so I thank them. Uh, these are all the folks who did, I didn't get a chance to quote them all, but who did uh, offer, up their, offer up their ideas and their names. So let's talk about the Twinkie. Can we turn on the mic now? Because we'll have some, we have 40 minutes to talk and uh, I'll probably give you a little buffer to the next session. So. Have you guys been limbering up? Have, w working out your, uh, your, your toss box? Your catch box, pardon me. Thoughts, questions, concerns. Trolling. Anyone got any? Anyone want to start? So I'll start with. I'll, I'll get a question going. Um, does anyone have a good horror story about dual booting they they care to share? Well, 
I'll share. Um, oh, here. Well, actually, is that it? Oh, we lost it. I'm waiting for the highlights reel of, you know, tosses and misses. Ours has <laughs> been a, uh, a changing dynamic over the past. We've been doing it since 2007. Okay. But not for centrally managed machines. Okay. Primarily for our student population. We do it for faculty and staff too, but 80, 90% of the installs are for students. So we don't control the hardware. Um, and it's to allow mostly engineering, architecture students to use Windows only software like SolidWorks. But we went from a process of just cloning directly mm -hmm. to trying to clone with SysPrep so that it would prepare for the different hardware and not have to go through the driver battle as much, which was the horror story of an audio driver blue screening a third of the machines all summer. Oh boy. Um, and SysPrep giving you nothing to eventually rolling out, rolling System Center into it. Mm -hmm. So we're actually capturing system center images so it can go through that process. So I, as the Mac admin, I'm not spending 70% of my time maintaining Windows images. Um, and then also due to load, we do anywhere from 100 to 600 simultaneous installs in a very short window. We have uh, about an hour to get them done. So download time was becoming an issue because of the size of the image. So we actually use BitTorrent for, gave a talk here years ago about yep. how to do that. It was, uh, um, but that's worked probably the easiest and best. It's the only thing that's worked for us well. But the rest is, it's just the, the changing in the hardware has always been a constant battle. The changing of the different Windows OSs and, and the nuances of each of those. And we've kind of went from what had been a fully automated process where our students can just click a link on a website and download an installer and run it completely on their own to now because of um, issues with the EFI hardware and not being able to get, for our particular environment, a, a, a solution for that yet that requires manual intervention being a bit of a horror this past year because we've had to manually touch almost 2,000 installs Ooh. by hand over the course of a period of time. And now with SIPs, that's just been, be really nice if Apple gave a method for us as de devs or, e or even the actual um, vendors, a means of circumventing at least that and understanding maybe it shouldn't be touching spots, but I think it's been a little over too protective because that's created another hurdle for us. So we went from fully automated to one manual process to now like three manual processes. So it's, it's getting to be a lot more hairy having to deal with. So we've actually this year as a remedy to some of that is the past several years, we've gotten to doing all 100% of our Mac students just go ahead and set them up dual boot just in case they ever needed Windows It would be there to backing off and only hitting the majors we know are absolutely going to need it and then let the rest trickle in. So it cuts our load down to about a third. So Excellent. Take it for what it's worth. Cool. Well, I, mean, I think you, you start off another part of the discussion I did want to ask you. There are two things I did want to ask you guys today, which is how many folks are fighting with or anticipating a fight with SIP? Yeah, because I got a lot of feedback on that in the survey. Also, how many folks are um, have had trouble with the five K with Windows and the five K iMac? I've heard tell that the Windows driver is really, really wonky, and like treats it. I've heard someone made some notion that it it treats it as two displays. <laughs> oh, we did have one. Um, I want to say that's yeah. It's a lag on the drivers being updated in boot camp yet. Right. Because they actually issued drivers for the hardware, but then changed something in the hardware. There was a revision. Ah. So. Cool. And that's happened before. Uh, USB 3 drivers for, you know, there was a year where we had it, MacBook Airs, where boot camp driver that came when you downloaded the machine was a USB 2 only driver. You would yeah. image, and you had no keyboard and mouse, and were totally stuck. You couldn't do a thing. Yeah. So. Yeah. yeah, and that's what we ended up. Luckily, we already had System Center built into it. We're able to go to the vendor and tell, I think was who it was, get a whatever beta version they had of that driver you enforce it to use that and inject it. Um, what started off as a simple little, oh, we'll just clone it and put it in here and build it in an installer. We've now made it a very large convoluted process. Right. It makes it a much smoother install, but there's a huge amount of infrastructure and years of creating and, and testing and 
working the kinks out to get it to that point then. Uh, absolutely. You know, uh, we had a similar issue where we had a um, 24 inch IMAX that were sort of born with USB 3 and we were trying to, in I think the session uh, the two canoes did, they talked about sort of importing a standard image from uh, like the, if, you're, if your enterprise has given you an image and they, that's sort of the, this is the Windows image that you want to put on all your machines. And we had to go through a very sort of convoluted process to take it from a ghost image, put it on a hard drive, then clone it over using WinClone to a machine, and then write a script that would boot, that would launch the boot camp drivers. Because if you just cloned it over, you got this very tantalizing machine that was full color, full Windows login with no IO at all. And you're like, this most this works, but it I can't do a darn thing. So, but um, so I guess something else I'd like to sort of talk to the audience about, and then I guess, you know we can keep talking, or we can you guys can take a break. Is um, back to the slides a little bit. Uh, I find a little bit of discord in that most people find this to be functionally advantageous, but a lot of people are talking about finding new avenues. Could someone toss this gentleman in the box? Hey, uh, I was just wondering if anybody has tried using Windows 10 yet for dual boot? Yeah, yeah we and, it. and how's that going? Uh, it's been fine. Um, if you had a Sorry. I'll spot you. We just started looking. We just started. I just want to get back and uh, end up deploying it. Um, we had a disable SIP um, for it to work. Um, we deployed to it didn't work correctly for us. Uh, with uh, double, like it wouldn't, ju it would make the image, but it wouldn't let it boot. Um, I think, to be honest, I think I did try it before I disabled SIP, so I might have to go back and give that a try again. But uh, WinCon, the Pro Edition, works fine. I could put it into my deploy, uh, deploy studio workflow. Uh, I have a script that runs before that, that uh, there's a guy named Chuck, something who made a blog who kind of goes through the steps of what he did. Uh, even to the point where it'll look at your sysprep, uh, your answer key, and change the name on the computer, and kind of go through all that stuff. Um, but using the Wincom Pro hasn't been a problem for us. Cool. Uh, we don't want Oh. That's probably the reason for the fusion drives. Fusion drives, yeah, and that is actually another thing I didn't put in the presentation is that fusion drives are tricky because you don't, if you're using Windows, I'm double making myself, this is insane. Uh, um, if you're using fusion drives, you really can't, you, you, on, on Windows, you really reap no benefit because of the way Boot Camp has to set things up that it does, that Windows doesn't know about sort of the dynamic allocation that Mac OS X does of moving your sort of common your common or popular files to the SSD. So Yeah. Has there been anybody who maybe went this route and then after a certain point ended up switching to a VDI solution, RDS, Citrix, any of those that are available? And I'd be curious to hear how that worked out, better, worse, or indifferent. Um, if you did, were you using heavily um, big programs that require a lot of resources? One of the reasons a lot of people say, oh, just do a virtual machine, but our labs have like ArcGIS and stuff like that, and running that on a virtual machine, it could barely run it on the w when it run it in boot camp by itself. On the virtual machine, you're taking half the resources already in the Mac. Has anyone had success with that? We're doing virtual or any big heavy software like Photoshop or anything like that.
I think it certainly is a concern. I mean, it would be my concern in some of the comments. I think there's someone, uh, I think it was our, our friend from Switzerland who uh, was concerned about that or was pointing that out as their use case. Uh, right, because, and someone was telling me, and if they're here, you'll have to, you can, you can raise your hand, saying that they were, had to deploy a piece of, tell them over, uh, I think it was dinner last night or something, that um, they had a piece of software that required eight gigs of RAM and they, their machines had eight gigs of RAM. So it's like, if you're running in a VDE, you're running in a virtualization situation, you obviously have the, you have already sort of broken your system require, you know, broken your system requirements. But, you know, that's the case. My experience has been that, you know, you do, if you really need the hard, if you really need to leverage the hardware, you're gonna, if you're using ArcGIS or using Photoshop or Maya or something like that, then you're gonna really, uh, Autodesk, that thing, you're gonna, those kind of things, you really wanna get at the hardware itself. But uh, I, I know where I work, they, they push the, the boundary a little bit. I mean, not so much for all OSs, not just for, for, for Mac computers, but uh, that they do have in like a Citrix environment you can get into, they do have, uh, prior to our having a site license, they did have like Acrobat, but it ran like garbage. But for the one person who needed to rip off a new PDF once every year and a half or so, it was a it was a use case, and I mean use cases are a lot of this is about use cases. There's you know why you're you know this is a dual booting anything like this is a time intensive process, and it's sort of like I think uh, David po points out. That's not David who pointed out, was it? Uh, I want to talk about this in a second actually. Uh, Someone talked about sort of lack of uh, standards. Uh, somewhere in here, I'll find it. But I'll keep talking while I do. That there's, uh, that you do kind of have to roll your own to some degree. I mean, certain you know folks provide uh, I guess they're sitting in our challenges section. Uh, no real standards. No real standards. So you are kind of, you know, those things like Two Canoes and, do, and Deploy Studio and, and Casper all kind of have these things, you know, and other tools can kind of do this. You are taking on a project because there are no real standards and there are a couple ways, as with a lot of IT things, there are a couple ways to skin this cat. Uh, and that's where your use cases become really important. But, um, things. So, so up to, I wanted to see how many folks, I know the frustration, the gentleman who, I, I left Goucher College and the gentleman who took over for me, Andrew, who is quoted in this presentation, got rid of dual boots pretty quickly because he, they were having just tickets piling up because every, like I said in the dirty secret section, every OS is sort of two OS, every computer is really two computers. And also if you have a, prefer, a preferenced operating system, you know, p patterns of preference, you, something doesn't get updated, or it's not getting patched, or it's not getting checked into the management system. Have folks had any experience with that of things that don't, they're not getting updated or not getting kind of addressed properly in the way, aren't, you know, just by the nature of being dual boot, are they, do they make themselves into sort of second class citizens on the network? Shortest throw ever. Uh, um, we had, I mean, most of our users are using, we're, most of our users do prefer to use Mac, uh, but um, for updates and stuff, we got to a point where we didn't need to update as much. Um, where we started doing more proactively updates. We use Fog for our project for imaging on the Windows side. Right. Uh, so we've been pushing out the big like Flash or whatever needs to be updated that way. Um, but we are starting to look at uh, Puppet as mm -hmm. a way to kind of keep the machines up to date. And that way, when it does get into Windows or 
someone logs off, it'll check with Puppy and get whatever updates we push out, whatever new software we need to push out. Cool. Yeah. I mean, I don't do so anymore, but years ago I used to uh, handle dual boot like computer labs. Which right. Is a little different. So luckily we didn't have data to worry about as much. Um, but back then we were using Radmine. I don't even know if anybody knows yep. what that is anymore. Um, to manage the Mac side, and but also used it to handle copying the Windows image locally and then just have them re-image each night. Mm -hmm. So updates weren't that much of an issue in that regard. Radmine definitely was able to handle that for the Mac side. We just right. update the image periodically for the Windows side and re-image. So that was the best case. For our student population, what we do now, it's really up to the user. It's just a matter of really trying to train them when we're doing that process. I'm sure they don't listen and don't adhere to it, but to tell them, you know, periodically, once a quarter, once a semester, to boot in Windows, let it run the hundred and something updates, get those <laughs> antivirus updates, whatever else you might need, just to keep that system patched, if they intend on using it. Then again, some of them, after six months a year, realize they didn't need it for whatever class they thought they might, right. or it's just eating up hard drive space, they're not gonna have time to play Steam games, whatever reason, mm -hmm. they end up deciding they just wanna reboot it, and that's the one beautiful thing of the process, is it's two clicks and a password, and poof, it's we can blow it out. Yeah. Windows goes away. Yeah, you can have... undo that process a lot faster than you can do it. So um, that's kind of been a self-solving feature. We find if they're not using it as often or ever, then it's a moot point. If they're not right. booting to it, they're going to remove it anyway. Yeah. Um, uh, if they do use it, then they're going to be in it using it more often, or at least for that semester or whatever projects they're working on. And then they're going to all those things are automated anyway from our antivirus updates, software updates, everything's going to get pushed. Cool. Us, so. Is it safety to Could you toss the box no. just so we can um. see? Has anyone pixie, them, pixie booting their Macs to get to SACM? Uh, uh, okay, our process is weird. Uh, <laughs> and I know ours is very unique because I have yet to find anybody else doing this. So. Good luck looking up information when you're making something new. You're not going to find any resources other than your own blog posts about what you're doing. For the Mac imaging part, they're actually downloading, as I said, a torrent to get the image in locally and then clone it across. Okay. But once you boot into Windows the first time, we could never get Pixie Boot directly to work. That being said, we can use it if we're doing it of a more manual nature. So for instance, if we have system center boot flash media, we can do that as a manual process. In fact, our my coworker, the system center guy, really wants pushes our uh, laptop support personnel, student helpers that help us to just do it and skip a few steps because they could manually partition, boot off the flash key, pixie booting in that realm, and it's booting when PE, pulls the image, pulls the drivers, does all the task sequence stuff to get it to work at all we couldn't ever do it like as the we, we tried originally just cloning the boot media in but then you run into the problem you're trying to image or load a, the drive you're booting from and could never get around that and after a few months of you know letting that table for a while got a wild hair idea of well let's go one step further in a process let's get past that point so we we're past the boot media it thinks it's at the pre-stage media stage so it's already, you, you actually wind up with both WinPE and Windows in the same partition, both operating systems. Wow. Yeah, it, it works. Well, sort of works. Uh, we have the BCD problem where the WinClone software works great in a normal default install using your normal bootcamp setup because it modifies and fixes the BCD file for the new partition you just made it. So it knows where to tell the EFI stuff where to go to boot but it's too helpful. It mangles our BCD file because we don't want it to boot into Windows. We want it to boot into P WinPE. So it boots to the wrong OS for us, which is where we ended up having to do a manual step. Um, so when they boot to Windows that first time, it's not gonna boot properly. The BCD's pointing the wrong OS. We have to boot off Flash me Media manually. We have a little script. It's a process I've only been able to do on Windows. You can't do it on the Mac side at all. Where it does whatever proprietary step Microsoft does to modify the BCD to fix it for Windows PE, then we can boot back 
in a normal automated process. When PE picks up, goes, oh, look, I'm already a step into the process. I've already got Windows here. So it just it recognizes it's past that point, then ties to System Center, gets the drivers, gets the software. Um, and we even have it built so we have a giant boot camp matrix that I can make available if anybody needs it that yep. tells which versions of boot camp and which driver sets to use for which Apple hardware. So we run this on anything, no matter what they have. And we just update that live on the system center side, inject those drivers to get them. And there's a thing called Brigadier where you can, it's kind of painful, but you can dig through the files. Um, I think one of the files is something like 80,000 lines long. So searching is very helpful to find the URLs to get to trick Apple software update to send you those bootcamp drivers because there's no website now. Apple That's doesn't do that. It's yeah, it's the only thing available. So we've been able to do that, get a list of all those, keep track of that, and just keep that matrix updated as new hardware's out. But as soon as we see new hardware, because I expect this summer, they do it to me every summer, yep. they're going to drop new hardware. We're going to have students show up an hour after they start selling it. And we don't have a controlled environment. That's been our, we're always on that bleeding edge of, you know, for the departmental machines, we can hold off purchasing hold off whatever we want to do the students are walking in that door with whatever whatever operating system on the Mac side whatever hardware they just bought it's before we could even test it or get it ready so as soon as we can get those drivers the beauty is we can inject it on the back end and system center now and not have to rebuild the whole installer and and to do it or even really test anything we just throw it in and it either works or it doesn't but um, so yeah what the, the big trick there was skipping that first step not trying to boot directly off win PE or excuse me, off pixie booting, but making it think you're a step in on pre-stage media and having that in that image along as the Windows OS. And so we're kind of capturing that, a step into the process, and then that's what we're deploying on the machines. So it's tricking everything into just running through the system center process. Cool. Again, convoluted, weird, it took some time to build, a lot of communication with my system center, Microsoft guy, back and forth. But once you kind of got it going, it really made makes my life easier. It doesn't make his life necessarily easier because now he's having to, you know, it's more for him to maintain and keeping those driver sets in there. But he's already built that world. That that was that infrastructure was already in place for all our Windows machines right. anyway. It's just another hardware type, another Dell, and another Lenovo. God help you, Gateway. You know, whatever you may have. <laughs> Um, but it's just one more thing that he just inserts in there. He had to add a little bit for the hardware detection and figuring out the boot driver stuff, but really that was about the only modification he had to do on his side. The rest is, falls more on my side anyway, which, you know, it takes maintaining the Windows image and drivers and sets and stuff off my plate, which is, was not my purview. I was having to learn. I hadn't done Windows since NT, so having to okay. get back up to speed and learn sys prepping and learn back to you know registry edits and that was getting out of my gamut of what I even wanted to learn out of force being forced into it so it put it back why am I rebuilding the same thing he's doing or in a similar nature and and worked out for both of us so cool well thank you um I w have one other question for folks uh well I have two questions and then I will let you go a little bit early uh <laughs> You know, hit the restrooms before they get busy, et cetera. Which is, uh, first off, this is the survey. Like, these are the results of the Google survey. And I quoted you some cherry picked sort of uh, comments. But um, there are lots of comments that folks added. Would you guys, when I post like the slides, would you guys want to see, like, that's all sort of, sort of the, the um, I guess you'd say the fire hose? What do you think? You guys would like to see that? Okay, I'll put that in. I, I, I'll, 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 I think some person put in. Uh, a few, there's one person there who put in something I think I, who's just messing with me. But yeah, well, I'll, pu I'll put this up. Um, and uh, the only other question is like, in terms of like if people who have done this, is if anyone have any, pre like there's things like Refit and there's like things like Boot Runner and before that was Boot Picker. Do folks, ha has anyone sort of had a preference or had a, b a better experience with one or the other? I've had all three, I've had all three. 
Okay, he's had all three. Okay, anybody else? Any? The big advantage of something like Boot Picker, which is which is an Apple product, sort of was an Apple sort of Skunk Works product, and now is kind of gone away of the Dodo, and uh, something like Boot Runner is uh, it. You're actually in Mac OS at the time. It comes over, over the Mac OS login window, and that means you can use your management tool. You don't have a machine that's sort of just stuck in like the EFI environment, so if you need to remote into it, manage it, inventory it, that sort of thing, you can, whereas if you have something that's like sort of perpetually stuck in the boot, uh, and you also you have things, silly things like thermal control and all that sort of, you know, fans aren't just gonna be running like crazy. And it, it, you're in an OS, but you do need to sort of reboot to, uh, to do that, um, you're gonna, when it the pick goes, it reboots. But uh, yep, oh. can someone toss the box to? I'm sorry, I'm I'm blanking on your name, and I feel terrible because you've been such a help. Carl Keen. Ah, thanks, Carl. Um, this is Carl. Carl is awesome, by the way. So um, I haven't done this in a while, um, but back when I was at Stanford, we did a big dual boot system, and this was right at the early bleeding edge when Apple had just come out with the drivers and there, and there was barely any infrastructure at all and we decided we had a number of, of things that we needed to do that no one was offering and there really wasn't tools for. Uh, e yeah, uh, Scooboot was one of the names. Um, uh, I, I don't happen to know where they are with it, whether they're still using it, whether they've advanced it, whether it's still <laughs> where we had, I've got no idea. But just to outline it so that if somebody either wanted to go to them or wanted to redo it, one of the, one of the decisions we made, two of the decisions we made earlier on, we didn't want to favor one, one side over the other. We felt part of this was trying to give everybody a choice and we didn't want to pre-choose anything for anybody. We also didn't like the fact that if you had two Windows users in a row, um, that you that all the existing solutions, and that almost applies today, um, you had to be in one, you had to be, you had to go back to Mac OS between the two users in order to make it work. Um, so that, and we wanted, we wanted to manage each platform out of the other, uh, out of that platform. Um, so we created a fancy thing that had an EFI layer. So every reboot would go into our custom EFI layer. Um, we went super fancy with it and we actually had it get a DHCP address out of the EFI layer, ask our servers what it should do, and if the servers didn't have an opinion, then they'd go with the user, what the user had requested. Um, and then it would then it would just go through that and then instantly boot to one OS or the other. So we didn't have the problem with fans and the rest of that because we weren't in EFI long enough. Um, and we got that down to about two seconds. Um, huh. So it, it, it was a bit of a hit, but it wasn't that bad. Um, and then on the two login screens, we created a window next to your login window um, actually, on the Windows side, it was your login window because you could replace it at least at that point. Um, and that login window said, you know, I want to boot into this other OS. Um, I actually open sourced the Mac OS side, which I just checked doesn't compile at the moment. Oh. Um, but uh, many, many, many yeah. moons. What, um, what, uh, which one of the, was it the 70 releases we decided upon last night? <laughs> yeah, uh, it was 90, okay. estimated of 94, 96, but yeah. yeah. Um, but my point here is that there is a, there is a possibility using a, an EFI layer and they're not all that tough to make, especially if you're not doing complicated stuff and Stanford might be willing to open source this. That was the plan, it's just we, Stanford hit their layoffs and I got cut off during their layoffs and just, you know, the team that was left w had fewer people to do more work. Um, and so I think that just, that just never happened. Bec and then I think everybody has since left. Um, but th the code exists somewhere. If they're willing to do it, you have a starting point. Um, and so a, a project to, to recreate this would work. And because it would be booting off an EFI layer, you'd, 
once you got it set up, you'd be avoiding SIP altogether. Why? Um, you'd be making no changes to the boot thing. You just have to make sure your boot setting always remains on that EFI layer. That's cool. Um, I, that's so if, if someone wants to put resources at it, there's some work already done for you, and talk to me, and I'll try to uh, direct you to the right people. That's cool. Sounds like something for the hackathon next year. Uh, I'd be a little more involved than that. Or to maybe finish at the hackathon. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you guys all for joining me. I, I hope uh, this has been helpful. It's been a pleasure to talk to you today. I will share the slides. I will share the uh, survey results. Um, and uh, it's, it's another great year at uh, Penn State, uh, at Mac Admins Penn State. So thank you for, uh, thank you for joining me this morning. Uh, I got to hit a bus, so uh, I can hang around for, for a few minutes, but uh, I can't take the candy with me. So please, please enjoy. Uh, Thank you very much.